Good evening, and thank you for coming to uh, this reading, this talk, this introduction to my new book, uh, Sex, Mom, and God. And um, if you can't read the uh, subtitle here, which I could not without my reading glasses if I was sitting where you are, it is How the Bible's Strange Take on Sex Led to Crazy Politics and How I Learned to Love Women and Jesus Anyway. Subtitles are meant to get you interested in the book, and I hope that one does. Um, Sex, Mom, and God is the third and last book in a trilogy. Uh, each of the books in the trilogy are standalone. In other words, um, you can buy one and read it without having to read all three. Uh, if you get halfway through one and pitch it across the room, maybe the next one will be better and you'll like it. So either way, it works out. But uh, let me just review what these are. The first is Crazy for God, a, a memoir uh, with the subtitle, How I Grew Up as One of the Elect Helped Found the Religious Right and live to take all or almost all of it back. And that is this book here in paperback. The second volume uh, is Patience with God, Faith for People Who Don't Like Religion or Atheism, and that is this volume here. And the third uh, is this book here, Sex, Mom, and God, How the Bible's Strange Take on Sex Led to Crazy Politics and How I Learned to Love Women and Jesus Anyway. So without any uh, further ado, what I will begin with tonight is to read you the introductory remarks from Sex, Mom, and God, which will set up my talk, but also let you know a little bit about what this book covers uh, in terms of what the reader would find in it. One of the things I love most about being with my grandchildren is that they only know me now. So before I explain why I had sex with an ice sculpture and how my family helped push the Republican Party into the embrace of the religious right, and chronicle my family's complicity in several murders, let me say that my granddaughter Lucy has just turned two. She, along with my three other grandchildren, is my second chance now that I've carved out a spiritual identity as dramatically eclipsing of my former self as if I disappeared into a witness protection program. My four grandchildren, Amanda, Benjamin, Lucy, and Jack notwithstanding, I'm still prone to label people and ideas as my mother labeled them. Mom divided everything into very important things, say Jesus, virginity, Japanese flower arrangements, lust, see-through black lingerie to be enjoyed only after marriage, and everything else, say those things that barely registered on my mother's to-do list, like homeschooling me. So I'll be capitalizing some words oddly in this book, such as sin, God, love, and girls, and also words like him when referring to God. I'm not doing this as a theological statement, but as a nervous tick, a leftover from my Edith Schaefer-shaped childhood, and also to signal what loomed large to my mother and what still looms large to me. Blessedly, Lucy and Jack live only a few hundred feet up the street, I walk to their house every day and collect them for playtime. When it's Lucy's turn, she perches in my arms and talks to me. Jack is six months old and pulls my nose and laughs a lot, but isn't saying much yet. Lucy likes to be carried when we stroll back to Ba and Nana's house. I'm Ba, and my wife, Jeannie, is Nana. Lucy's big brown eyes scan the 18th century clabbered houses of our New England neighborhood to see which of the ubiquitous American flags are wrapped around their above the front door flagpoles by the wind bar, and which are waving free in the ocean breeze. When we get to my house, Lucy commands me to read The Tale of Two Bad Mice by Beatrix Potter. It's a story about two deluded mice, Hunkamunka and Tom Thun, who mistake a dollhouse dinner laid out in the dollhouse's miniature dining room for real food. When they discover that the lovely looking ham, fish, and pudding can't be eaten, they smash up the plaster food in revenge and then spitefully ransack the dollhouse. When she wrote the book in 1904, Potter couldn't have known that her classic story would someday be an allegory aptly illustrating the delusions suffered by members of the American religious right. Some people who helped lead that movement, including me, were very much like Hunkamunka and Tom Thumb. We lived lives informed by beliefs that were not based on fact and that led to deep-seated resentments that couldn't be cured because what we resented never actually happened. 
We took it as a personal insult that the real world didn't conform to the imagined religious facts that we'd been indoctrinated to believe, and so we did our share of smashing. My late father, Francis Schaeffer, was a key founder and leader of the religious right. My mother, Edith, was herself a spiritual leader, not the mere power behind her man, which she also was. Mom was a formidable and adored religious figure whose books and public speaking, not to mention biblical conditioning of me, directly and indirectly shapes millions of lives. For a time, I joined my dad in pioneering the evangelical anti-abortion religious right movement. In the 1970s and early 1980s, when I was in my 20s, I evolved into an ambitious, successful religious leader instigator in my own right. And I wasn't just dad's sidekick. I was also mom's collaborator in her mission to reach the world for Jesus. I changed my mind. I no longer ride around saving America for God, nor am I a regular on religious TV and radio these days. Nevertheless, like those two bad mice who later felt remorse and so put a crooked sixpence in the doll's Christmas stocking to pay for the damage they'd caused, I'm determined to acknowledge the destruction I contributed to before Lucy grows old enough to inherit the vandalized dollhouse that shall soon discover lurking beyond her childhood horizon. So that's the beginning of that book. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the book, why I wrote it, and then I will be glad to take your questions. The trilogy here, um, which my publisher calls the God Trilogy, uh, comes out of personal experience, lived on two levels. One is as the child of a preacher who then became a religious right figure and a political figure in America. And the world seen through a child's eyes sometimes brings a reality to a subject that is missed by adults who don't hear the arguments at night once the light's out in their parents' room, who don't see the inside story of the hero that sometimes other people put on a pedestal. But then there's a second thread that runs through these three books, and that is my own life journey, which began with me as the sidekick of my father, Francis Schaeffer, in my late teens and early 20s, when I helped him make a film series called How Should We Then Live with a Book Companion, and another film series called Whatever Happened to the Human Race with a Book Companion, that one with C. Everett Koop, who became Surgeon General of the United States under Ronald Reagan. And those two series together did two things. First of all, they made my father very famous in the evangelical ghetto, and I say evangelical ghetto, not in a sense of disparagement, we all live in ghettos, whatever club we're part of. We are in an Orthodox church today, so we know about Orthodox things and people who know about NASCAR like cars turning left. And those of us who uh, live in the States don't know that any other countries exist most of the time. We just live here. So what I mean by evangelical ghetto is simply that you can be very famous in one part, little sliver of our culture, but have never been heard of by, by most other people, and that would have been Dad's case. But within the evangelical community, if you had asked somebody in 1979 or 1983 who the leaders were, and certainly the intellectual leaders of evangelicalism, my dad's name would have been at the top of many lists, if not most lists, uh, and certainly on the top of all lists. And um, evangelicalism um, shares something with North Korea, as a matter of fact, and that is a, a nepotistic system of succession. So if I had been in North Korea, I would have been Kim Il-jung the 17th or whatever. But being the son of an evangelist, it seemed very natural for me to become his sidekick. And I was not alone. Franklin Graham now runs the Billy Graham organization. Oral Roberts' son, Richard, who I knew quite well in the past. In fact, I knew all these people well, uh, inherited that and then finally had a divide with the college. And, uh, separated from them, uh, all kinds of other people. Pat Robertson's kid ran the 700 Club for a while and so forth. It seems normal. And we were kind of bred for these leadership positions, as I say, perhaps not to inherit the call from the Holy Spirit, but certainly to inherit the mailing list, which to most of us <laughs> seemed a lot more valuable. So that was my world. Son of a preacher who went to Europe as a fundamentalist missionary in the 50s and was very obscure and unknown. And I talk about in the book, Sex, Mom, and God, how one of the great desires of my youth was to have protein, any kind of protein, in the sense that we had a very meatless diet, and it had nothing to do with keeping Eastern Orthodox fasts either. It just had to do with the fact that my parents were trying to stretch macaroni and cheese a long way 
to feed a lot of students and hitchhikers and backpackers who came through to their ministry called Labrie Fellowship in those days. One of the great things about having a dad who wrote some bestsellers and then 